G'day, g'day, how's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here just spoke with Dean Holmes. Really good advisor. He's got a, a practice that's quite successful. It also spun off into its own uh, dealer group now with Ben Nash at Pivot Wealth. You got Jess and Glenn at Fox and Hare, uh, Catherine Gross, a bunch of high performers. Um, it doesn't surprise me though. It's, it's XY actually, actually, XY pretty much kicked off from a conversation that, that Dean was having uh, you know, with Ben. Uh, many years ago, and Ben was sort of telling me that there was all these things you could do besides super investment insurance in the advice world, and it blew my mind. And and then ever since then, we've been on this quest for knowledge. Uh, we tackle some pretty cool topics, uh, everything from why uh, females tend to make better advisors, um, all the way up to the best interest duty. And I sort of hamper on that again. I tend to, it's, a, it's a sticking point. It's an impossible position, the best interest duty to, to live up to. And I mean, any lawyer these days, if you if you listen to these guys that specialize in this field, they're going to say it's impossible. No one can live up to it. So I think we've got some major issues there to, to hopefully overcome. And so that comes out in conversation. And uh, yeah, look, uh, Dean's just a, an all-round great guy. He's got some really good insights. And uh, hopefully you pull some things out from this conversation and start using it in your own advice world. All right, cheers. Hopefully you enjoy. This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. For those XYNs, XYers, that have been around for a fair few years, I think your your uh, your claim to fame was running the the business from from the UK. Yeah. And I, and I did one of your uh, first sort of you know, the day down at the water and I did, not only did I run my business from the London, then yes. I participated in a, uh, exactly. in the XY conference remotely with my business shirt at the top <laughs> and uh, shorts at the bottom <laughs> uh, Yes, <laughs> at 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the morning or something that, like that. Literally, that was one of the, one of the highlights. Um, yeah, that was really cool. And for, for anyone that's listening that wasn't there that day, this is back in 2000 and... At least three to three and a half years yeah, ago. Yeah, 15, yeah. something like that. I've been back for two years, so. Yeah, um, and so we had a full day event down at Dalton House and uh, you gave one of the sessions via via Zoom. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was Matt, well, all the way from the UK, which was, which was super cool. And then Ben and I like to talk about you as the father of XY or the granddaddy of XY because <laughs> – you were the first one to sort of sprinkle the little bit of financial planner dust into his head. And we were just, you know, five years ago, we didn't know anything. Um, and then, man, a lot of it sprung up from there. And then uh, you, you've you got a connection with Roxy as well, who, who's who's one of the, the, the kick-ass guys here uh, in, the, in the community. And then you yourself ha- have a really cool career. And you're only a couple of years older than me, but you, you're – got your own financial planning business um, and you've got your own license now with, with other financial planning businesses and the, those businesses are kicking ass, I will say. So I don't know if you choose really well or if you've got some sort of coaching going on, whatever you're doing there. It's amazing. It's always the people. It's always, it's, yeah. you got to choose, you got to choose the right people. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The two, the other podcast that I was on a few months ago, that was mm. all about people Hiring, yeah. firing, and things like that. Yes. Um, a big part of what we do is that about people within our organization or people that join us in the licensee. Yeah. It's knowing that you've got the right people up, up front yeah. because that's alignment of vision, align, alignment of values. Yep. Those things drive everyone's decision-making framework. And so if you make the right decisions in the front end about who comes in yes. to your world, you know that you can trust them on an, on, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. It's a... But the good people are so hard to find. 
Oh, exactly. So yeah. hard to find. But you've got to talk. You've got to talk to a lot of people. You know, mm. you've got to. Uh, so you do, you do have to have meetings, have conversations. Uh, right. But the whole network that we've built so far is actually just from referrals as well. So and it is called the Wealth Network, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about uh, the Wealth Network, and I'm not sure if it's still the case, but uh, there was either a 50-50 male to female or even more than 50-50 male to female. Yeah, yeah, right now we're probably slightly above 50% of total, if we include the staff of Absolute Wealth Advisors as yes. well. Yep. Um, but yeah, look, I've got a big focus on helping great female ad- females yeah. become advisors as well. Um, I think the balance should be 50-50 or, or more. Yeah, man. Uh, women are better financial advisors than blokes. Yeah. Uh, they get the relationship side. Yeah. They have emotional intelligence yeah. much more than what, what we do. Yeah. And so they're able to pick up on the subtleties of the relationship, yeah. I reckon, ahead of guys most yeah. of the time. And our industry is less about investments and more about relationships. And yeah. the sooner that we realize that so that we can practice the things that we're meant to practice about relationships uh, and also at the same time start to get investments out of our business because it's not the core focus of lots of financial planning or financial advice firms going forward. Um, And some of the businesses like uh, Pivot Wealth, that's Ben Nash, he's just won an award, Um, uh, Fox and Hare, they've done remarkably well, Jess Brady, being a part of that team, so yep. you, pick, you, you, you were able to um, score them, um, and th- there's a couple others, right? Yeah, we've got the first the first uh, lady that joined Catherine Gross. She was uh, right. she was the first one that sort of got the whole thing started. Yeah. Um, so so Catherine, she's got a fabulous business. She's got a great great yeah. business, and her her business model was all about coaching and coaching executives. females executives yeah. and coaching. Sort of, she's sort of pivoted a little bit now that she works with. Um, uh, divorcees as well to, yeah. to coach them and sort of help predominantly females through that process because mm. um, unfortunately that it's a single-sided male-dominated kind of decision-making that might have been in the past and yeah. so some Catherine's helping women to move out of that and obviously empower them to make their own financial decisions. Yeah. Um, she came to us through our network as well, through my business partner, Paul. And Catherine is the, is the as you say, the, the dust of, of, of the XY. Catherine's what got it all started. So we had yeah. never thought about uh, really being a licensee um, in that tradi- using that traditional word, word. We hadn't really thought about it yeah. until Catherine came along. And what what Catherine wanted was actually more of the coaching, mentoring, teaching side of learning to become a financial advisor mm. ahead of everything else. So lots of licensees out there will tick a box in terms of compliance, uh, yes. but the the mentoring side of it, of, of actually I've got this problem or I've got this client scenario, mm. it's really difficult to have zero or little financial planning experience and start your own practice at the same time. And so we've been able to sort of bring those two things together. Yeah. Um, Catherine and Fox and Hare are examples of that where you've got great people, great finance experience. So everyone that we have has already been in the industry for years. Yeah. But now they decide they want to use their powers for good instead of evil and actually <laughs> oh, yes. and actually run uh, run and look after clients as opposed as opposed to being within the institution. Institutions. Yeah, I like the way you've put that. It's hilarious. As someone that's uh, done the reverse of that, I just uh, come to the dark side. Yeah. That's what I say. <laughs> um, yeah. So could, because I, I, you, you've got a very you've got a very good insight into the, because on top of all that, you got a pretty successful financial planning business yourself, right? Yeah, I'll say yeah, it. yeah, yeah. We've been, we've had our, we had our ten year anniversary yeah. of, of starting the Congratulations, business. Congratulations, thank man. you. Uh, we, we saw, we knew that we were going to get to ten years probably at, at after we got past five, um, or maybe even after one. We, mm. we, we had a, we had a vision to grow the business from from day one. That we needed the business to be more than just a paycheck or a salary. Yeah. Um, and to do that, you've got to grow it staff it, put systems and processes in, which we're still doing today. As you grow through each each stage, stage of the business, you realize that you've grown and you've filled the bucket of staff, but also then you filled the bucket of of 
being able to know everything that's going on in the business. Then you've got to build a dashboard that tells you what's going on in the business because you can't know everything. Yes. Um, so we've done all that over, over time and we're doing it again. So we're getting ready to grow through the next phase as well. You're looking to, to, to take it to the next level? Yeah, look, Absolute Wealth Advisors as the business will be bigger in five in five years' time than it than it is today. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, my, fo- my focus is more on the, on the wealth network yep. um, but, and Paul and Stella are focused – focused in on the well on absolute wealth advisors mm. um so we're automating getting the staff right um using our technology and all those kind of things better so okay. that we can obviously service our clients in a, in a better way in a new way uh and then therefore Stella and Paul have more time to sit in front of clients as interesting well. and and so you and Paul um where did you guys meet and and who who's who does what role well, Paul hired me. So ah, he's, uh, get out of town. Yeah, yeah. So the so the circle of, circle of life is right. uh, Roxy hired me first. Yes. Um. So Roxy saw the saw the light. Um. <laughs> when I was getting out of corporate. Uh. But when announcer was getting started, and this was like. 13 years ago now, uh, the the announcer model was slightly different to what it is today. And yes. we were doing a little bit of prospecting using the phone, yeah. which is Roxy's, where Roxy <laughs> went back. If you go back, sorry, Roxy, 20 years, uh, that's how you were getting <laughs> clients and those kind of things. And look, broadly, it was really effective. Mm. They, we had some competition entry forms and there was some cold calling oh, or, cool. or warm calling, depending on what you, what, uh, ASIC wants to call it, but <laughs> essentially they were chatting to people about improving their financial position mm. um, and then getting them in to come in for a meeting and then having yep. a chat. Yep. Uh, I was, I don't know what I'll say, but I was not very good at cold calling. <laughs> uh, it was just, I had a real, I just couldn't interrupt people's days with, yeah. with uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, talking about financial oh, services. Man. So I'm it was with, pretty, with you. it yeah. was pretty tough. Um, so, and it was, it was, there was no salary. So he sold yeah, me yeah. the dream of, you know, a huge, <laughs> I'll be an advisor in two years time yeah. doing all these things. All I had to do was make 40 phone calls a day, yeah. which meant I booked X number of meetings and then I had a client a day. Yeah. So the dream didn't work for me, but it worked for lots of other guys. Yes. So it, the model, the model works and yes. look, he's, he's, the model's a little bit different now, but I think yeah. he's using other social media channels to do a similar thing of getting attention and getting his, the message out there. Yeah, correct. Um, so Roxy's doing a great job. Mm. I obviously couldn't, couldn't cut it. So I, <laughs> so he dropped me from the team or I dropped myself when I ran out of money. Right. Um, so that was the first forte into, um, being, you were essentially self-employed. If you yeah. made it, you made it. If you didn't, you were eating toast and yeah, okay. wheat bix So yeah. I was in the toast and wheat bix category. <laughs> <laughs> and decided I'd go and get a job, right? Um, and so that's when Paul hired me yeah, into right. the firm that we that he was working. Well, we both worked at for four years, right? And so I was his sort of associate advisor. No um, way! That that's so funny. That's how uh, I me and Ben almost. I oh, actually no, he didn't hire me, but I, I worked as his sort of what do you call it? It's just paper shuffler. Yeah, or exactly. Like that. Yeah. yeah. He, he probably he speaks more highly of you, Clayton. Uh, right? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then I started working with Paul. We worked for two years at a at a, another boutique planning business, um, and then I was getting ready to leave again because mm. I wasn't I wasn't happy with the direction of the firm and things like that. And so Paul grabbed me at the same time and said. I know you're thinking of leaving, I can tell. Uh, and so we made the decision that we'd actually think about leaving together. Uh, and wow. so that took two, we took two paths at that time. Could we find an existing business uh, that wanted to hire us as like Batman and Robin, like <laughs> sort, of, sort of style? <laughs> the skill sets in terms of the business is probably what I what is worthwhile to focus on in mm. terms of, you know, if you've come out of corporate, as simple as GST might be to some people, it has never been a, never been a concept to understand oh, man. at a business level. You used to be an accountant. Yeah, and I still divide, hate it. Divide by 11 times by 10, yeah. I don't get it. Then yeah. you involve super funds and they claim back the GST and yeah. all that it's kind gross. of stuff. It's complicated. Yeah. And so, but when you dive into the business owner world, you've now, you're now 
have to do all of these things. That's you have right. to know what you should charge. Yeah. You know, ha- have to know how to cha- how to charge it. You need to have a relationship with a bookkeeper that has yeah. to understand financial planning businesses and and do it. So yeah. there's all of those different elements that we try to take from the advisors yeah. and shit. Oh, we try to do the work internally or we pay an, a bookkeeper to do it, but yes. we have the same bookkeeper that works across all of our businesses right? so that we get that sort of economies of scale that she knows and understands financial planning businesses so she can do all of them much easier than us having seven, seven bookkeepers. Interesting. Um, so, but if we take it up, that's just like a micro example of what yes. we do. But at the, at the business level, we, we run a business coaching program. Do you? Um, which, yeah. Tell me about this. Which is Traction or uh, EOS, which we'll put in the show notes. Um, Yeah. So so, so you go to these guys for help on how to become better at what you do? Yeah, yeah. So we are coached by a coach that that is- I thought you were saying you had a business coaching- Business, but you are no, no, no. We're co- yeah, we we are coached by a business coach, and then we distill that down. And I'm the coach for, oh, say, Ben or Fox and right. Hare in the in the businesses. I run the I run those. Do you want a meetings. business coach X Y? Well, I think Roger's got that job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, we've met with him. He seems like a really cool guy, but uh, we've- he's awesome. I cannot, I cannot. Uh, say how amazing it's been yeah, oh okay, i can right. actually i'm about to and we'll cut this little bit for roger yeah it's been amazing yeah the the fact that we have been able to focus on the business to be able to set vision and vision and values and everyone yeah, does man. this but it's we've done it now in a really simple way for a small business so yeah. you know if you come off bank this vision and values thing takes hundreds of people and thousands and thousands of dollars to yeah, come man. up with their tagline, yes. which I cannot remember. So, totally. yeah, and they're obviously not living their vision and values when they make their decisions. So, yeah. and that's a corporate. When you bring it down to a small business, we are the we are the business. And so the tools that we've been able to use has allowed us to set what we want the vision of the business to be, mm. has allowed us to sort of document our values. We live and breathe them. So it's always in everything that we do. But now we've actually got them written on a piece of paper, for example. Um, and then we've been able to set through the through the program, we've got a 10-year vision for the business. That distills down to a three-year three year vision and then a one-year and 90-day rocks. So there's lots of business books that all use come around this same bit. This yes. There's a Rockefeller Habits, Vern Harnish has all done this type of research in terms of 90 day sprints. There's so many buzzwords that mean all the same thing. Yes. But by having a tool and following a process, we've been able to focus for 90 days on particular business tasks and achieve them. And at the end of the 90 days, set the next business tasks, achieve them. The end of the next 90 days, achieve them. So it's just been a discipline and that discipline is distills from those quarterlies mm. down into a weekly meeting pulse and activities that it just it just works for us. Yeah. Um, and anyone that's coming out of corporate, it kind of works for them as well because they've just got a process to follow. So now I've got Man. good people and they're able to follow a, a process that has some elements that's similar to the corporate life. Wow. That's a very good answer. I was expecting you to say something like just get on sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> we can't Koshi's only has so, so many friends so. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, that's so funny like Ben Ben became mates with Koshi and everything because of this whole XY thing because many years ago talk about visions and everything mm. we were like oh it'd be awesome to get Koshi to speak at an event and Ben just being Ben he's like get a mate just wanted it's, you to come yeah. talk at an event and mm. he was like what is this and he's and Ben just says, "Oh, look where this thing!" And then he speaks at an event, and, he, and then he goes on to become, you know, Koshi's like online financial planner yeah, yeah. guy, and now he's just getting roped in to do Sunday morning sessions. Yep. mate, it's great. That's it. So yeah. he'll have a beard consultant soon, and they'll be <laughs> trimming it properly for yeah. TV and all those kind of things. But yeah, look, it does, he's got a Ben has built a great. Um, social media PR mm. engine behind his bu- behind his business, yeah, which is allowing him to now grow the, grow his practice, and so yeah. it's it's external validation. In you know, we have an issue of trust in the industry, which we'll yeah. probably come back to. But yeah. he, being able to find 
out about Ben. If I'm thinking about take Ben being my advisor, for example, at least now I can go and see that he's out there in the in the marketplace yeah, doing different things. And that's how his demographic make decisions on when they like to buy. Like yes. you don't buy anything without reading the reviews. You don't even go to a cafe on Saturday morning mm. without checking the coffee brand online before we arrive yep. and reading the Google reviews. Yeah, man, so I, lo- I love a good trip version. advisor. If I'm somewhere, well, not trip advisor. I Google. like trip advisor. No, it's it doesn't work because it's not uh, it's not linked back to your personal profile. So they, there's oh. been, I think TripAdvisor, some of the reviews may have been made up over, in the past. Maybe they're fixing it out now. Sure. Um, but I prefer the ones that are linked to your person because if I, like, funny story, and Chica and I have used Google to, when we were traveling, mm. we would tag locations that we've been and review restaurants and cafes all around the world when we were traveling. And very, very That's recently... Mad our photos hit 1 million views so the Whoa. F- yeah it's cra- it's kind of crazy so uh, one so the photos that we've uploaded onto our Whoa. google account um, have been viewed a million times Whoa. now some of the photos are pretty average of what they're f- in yeah. some of the photos of me with my chicken schnitzel like saying this is a really big chicken schnitzel for example but <laughs> And that one hasn't got a lot of views, mind you. But for the ones um, in you and your boardies, for example, yeah, huge. So it's like a, a million people, a million or well, two million eyeballs, right, have looked at images that we've put up. No, in order to increase the trust or the or the buy-in of that particular venue like yeah or we've ranked it one star and people have made decisions the other way yeah but we there's an element of community trust that we and then another hundred people have all given it five stars and so yes. then we give it five stars and so, so you do google reviews yeah that's google reviews through google maps ah so yeah okay no no, yeah, no. So, so i'm sure if i looked up xy advisor on google there would be some reviews if there's not make if sure there's you not, give it a should, five star if everyone can do google five star reviews for the xy advisor uh group that, that would that would be great that actually would be very epic uh, and upload your photos so then you can see how many you can get <laughs> Just imagine all these schnitzels just... Uh... Yeah, look, if you <laughs> if you see my photos online, you'll see a few meal-related photos, but that's yeah. because I'm reviewing restaurants and places to go yeah. as you go around, uh, you know, Eastern No, that's Europe cool, because... man. I, I've never heard of someone doing that yeah. before. That's really cool. So, Because oh, I've done it, like, um, a couple of times in my life, maybe, like, three or four venues. Mm. Um, but I'd never... I actually don't even consider that someone's l- ever looked at it. Yeah, well, I'm up to a million. So I'll let wow. you know when you get to two million. I think it probably accelerates. We might be on the on Do the top. Do you get list. something? We you used to get um you used to get Google contributor credits. Like you used to get an extra ten gig on your Google Drive or something like Ooh. that. But data's free now. Like everything. Uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. you can hand that stuff out like cookies. They don't. It doesn't count because yes. we all have so much data now. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's I don't know why we got onto no, on that, but that was oh about Nashi like and trust. That's, that's his that's his element of trust that people can va- uh, externally validate his services. Yeah. If I think about my practice, the vast majority of the clients that we have have been referred by someone that's a friend and friend or family or associate. So yes. the trust is actually one on one. Whereas when you're going out, like Ben would go out to a group of people and do a talk or go out through social media through through Instagram for example, yes. people will will find him through there but then use the other tools to determine the trust. Yeah, that makes sense. And as a whole, our industry has suffered in, in trust um, for the last, mm. you know, it's, uh, for the last few years and now it's sort of hit its, its time. This, in, is our, this is our rock bottom. Yeah. This is, you know, waking up drunk yeah, the next man. morning going, what the hell did I do the Definitely. night before? And, We're and in the worst. We would be in the... Bot- we're at the bottom of the yeah. cycle of, of trust. Uh, yeah. There's probably a little bit more to come out when there the will be. you know the royal commission has to has to finish. Yeah. Um, and then there's a there's an element of rebuilding that trust, and there'll mm. be you know the large corporates are making changes in their business model, some quickly you know on the run to try to try to get ahead of what's coming in terms of the Royal Commission. Yeah. Others are selling. Uh, it's going to have an impact on how financial planning businesses might be valued in the in the future. Absolutely. Um, not that they 
I don't think that doesn't mean that they'll necessarily go down in value, but right. I think AMP underwrote a value by coming up with a particular form formula of recurring revenue mm. that might change to just the the normal EBIT multiple. Like every other business <laughs> in the world <laughs> essentially <laughs> trades on an EBIT multiple. Yes. And so somewhere along the way, we changed that and said, well, no, we're a little bit different. Yeah. And I get the history of why it happens. But now it's probably in the future, the transactions will still happen, yes. but they'll just be on a on an EBIT multiple. And so what that tells me is that businesses that focus on that EBIT thing, thing <laughs> EBIT calculation, they're building- You are the business guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm the business guy. <laughs> There'll be a little asterisk in what EBIT stands for. Um, but essentially, you're building a business when you focus on that, mm. as opposed to the smaller practices always traded on recurring revenue because the advisor was just, you know, maybe they had 200 grand of fees and that really was just their salary. Yeah, man. There's no EBIT in that. Yeah. Whereas if you think about you trying to build an EBIT focused business, you're trying to build a business that makes um, profit, mm. which then is a sell saleable business. Okay. And then th a business is systems, processes, you know, accounting processes, annual review processes, all of those things. That's a business. Whereas the old model of a, of a one man band advisor being just following his, just doing everything himself. Yeah. That was never a business. What do you? What would you like to see come out of the Royal Commission? Um, I sometimes I wanted there to be, uh, you know, debate and hearing both hearing both sides. I think that uh, the stuff that came out is is all of it is true. Um, but there's never there's never an opportunity to tell any of the good stories as well. Like we always, you know, the the advisors that are on the front line are, are working our asses off to actually do the right thing by the by the client 100%. in ninety nine percent of the cases. Yes. Like, and the the corporates have changed the incentives. Like, you know, we're going to go back now and realize that a vertically integrated Commonwealth Bank model just didn't work for the consumers. And so, and the banks are already working this out because of their capital requirements. Home loans are supremely more profitable than any other part of their business. Yeah. And so they bought all those other businesses because they could cross sell to one another. Now they're starting to realize that the cross selling to one another was the problem. The downfall. And so by not having all of those businesses, the banks will be Probably profitable in the in yeah. the future. Yes. Not that that's advice. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, but they'll focus on their they'll focus on their core, which is giving home loans, which is which is good. Yeah, um, and and then there'll be advisors that probably less and less advisors will be associated with financial institutions, and that's going to hurt the older generation because they've probably there is still the trust in banks. Uh, at that higher that at that older age bracket that yes. they still trust in the brands you know yes. that I could look after a little old lady but or she'll go into the Commonwealth Bank branch and unfortunately she'll trust that institution because it's been around for much much longer than than what I've been around whereas the younger generation will eas will easily tr trust new brands coming into the market you know much much easier because yeah. they'll just use this social validation to make sure that what they're doing is the is the right thing. Yes. Um, so it's it's a shame, but I understand why the positive stories can't come out. Um, and so really, we just got to clean up the mess. And it's the it's um, it's the institutions that have to clean it up. Like we don't have to do a lot of cleaning up. Yeah, that's a um, that's a very big gonna point cost as well. Them a lot, it's going to cost them a lot of money to do it. Yeah. And they're cleaning it up. They're cleaning up the past, even though they're not continuing the business in the future. So I wonder how that wonder how focused they'll be on it if they don't have to they're not trying to clean up so that they can be financial advisors again. They're yeah. sort of putting the lipstick on the pig to sell it. Yeah, it's or they've already sold it anyway. It's it's a weird thing, you know, that cross-selling issue that you were talking about uh when you've got trustees that were perfect example just using the in-house cash account whereas that there, there was other cash accounts available to the public, which the super fund could have used, but they chose to use the in-house mm. uh, bank, which paid a much lower interest rate. And then that is that is something that's so clearly 
not in the client's best interest, that it was like absurd that anyone thought that you can get away with that. Like that is, that is, you know, if, if I'm a trustee of a, a super fund and then I'm getting 1% in my money here, but just, and I'm just using it because it's in-house and then but there's 2.5% over there and then just being like, nah, we'll just use the 1%. We'll just do it over there. But that's such a... But this is, this is everything. It's like if you think about any board of directors, which is similar to a trustee, yeah. a trustee relationship, like there's just so much to do. Oh, man, you know, I know. Like a board of directors are going to go, there's a list of 20 priorities yeah, and they've yeah, got to yeah. work out which is the most important priority. There is definitely and that as well. Like a, a, part, a part of me goes... Well, who was expecting them to use something else, right? It's like, mm. of course, that the the that the bank is the bank is going to is, is, sorry, the is super fund the is going to mm. use the bank. Mm. Like, of course. So, uh, so I kind of go, well, then is like is is it too onerous the legislation? I I, I don't know, no, but no, like, but I know for a fact that it, it it's a clear breach of that legislation. Mm. And then I'm really interested to because. I don't think – I'm not convinced that more rules is the solution. I'm just not convinced that more rules are the solution. But, um, you know, simple and less rules would be uh, would be good. If there's no commissions on investments, right, that solves a lot of problems. If we get rid of APLs, that solves a lot of problems. I've, I'm actually less worried about alignment. Mm. With with no APL than I am about many other things because, I mean, back in the day, uh, in, independent financial advice just meant I use the ones that pay me the most commission. So yeah, but what, I'm independent of a thing. Yes. But the thing about APLs as the example was like who invented Man, APL? That's the weird. professional indemnity insurance industry invented the APL because they that's what they had to do to, yeah, to minimize their risk, control the risk. Right. So they came up with the term. APL, and they said to the AFSL, well, you've got to have this APL that your advisors are going to very, recommend very off. Very good then point. It just flows from there. It's like an insurance company excluding flood cover in a flood zone. Like <laughs> the insurance yeah. companies set up their rules and then we've played with it, you know, and then... Yes, yeah, in- because they wouldn't they wouldn't have gone to one of the, the, the aligned uh, models and said... Only put your own products on the APLs. No, so they're in, they're in, they're indifferent, right? They they don't care. Well, why don't we have just have an ASIC approved APL? Well, we do. The, we do. That's the ASIC regulated managed fund industry. That's but ASIC, isn't that all of them? That's all the managed funds. So every right. man, every managed fund is approved by ASIC, right? That's and wh- so ASIC, in order to do that, you've all already gone through the hoops to set up a re- regulated managed investment scheme. So why have um, APLs? I don't know. My God. You can have... you can, What in an advice business? So do I have an APL? That's yes, fine because right. you're an advice business. Thank you. Business. Thank yes. you. Like in terms of if ASIC were listening, yes, I have an APL. Mm. My my professional indemnity insurer knows my APL, but then I have this thing called a preferred product list. And Roxy said to me 12 years ago that's still in my head today, he's like, Roxy was like, we will manage the investments up here because I don't want you to blow up your business. Yeah. You know? And I went, yeah, that's pretty smart, Roxy. So the concept of a preferred product list is all about saying, as the wealth network, we want to agree the selection of the investment products that our advisors use, not to restrict them, but actually to make sure that the client's best interests are looked after and that the advisor doesn't go and do things that have the chance of impacting their business and therefore our business at the same time. Yes. Okay. So that's, we call that a preferred product list, but our, and our preferred product list is quite small and quite simple. Yeah. And it's basically just Vanguard, right? Thank you, Vanguard. <laughs> uh, Vanguard is part of our uh, preferred product list, yeah. uh, and they're our sponsors for today. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, the concept of uh, indexing is a core part of core part of our investment philosophy. Um, it's it's 
it's something that resonates with the with younger clients as well. They know, you know, you can explain it with a thousand different examples, but the fact that you see Warren Buffett talking about indexing mm. and people know and you know trust his advice, and yeah. he's saying if I, you know, he could do this. Yeah. There's an old story about Kerry Packer's old man, and if he just took, if Kerry Packer took all of the money that um, his father left to him in the estate and just put it in the index, mm. Jamie Packer would be like twice as rich now. Yeah, but um, nowhere near as much fun. No, not as much fun <laughs> of building casinos and doing all those kind of things. Yeah. So, yeah, it forms a core part of our business because it, because it works. Um, the next thing that, that uh, Vanguard has recently added to their portfolio is the, just the, an ethical tilt, ah. which is definitely starting to be requested by our this? clients and, and Fox and & Hare. Yeah, um, right. is yep. is probably the two places that it's coming up at the moment. Is that obviously you know like the upselling of Would you like fries with that? Mm. If you offer it, people will think about it, yes. and and we're having more people at that point in time yes. saying that I am interested in having my portfolio invested that way, uh, and the research is starting to support that that companies that think in this manner also perform better. Mm. So I was the old school a while ago of saying that, um, you know, I, I always had two arguments with it. I was always like, well, if you're going to own a mining company, then wouldn't it be better to own BHP? Because at least they were the most committed to this. They had the most social conscious because they were the biggest company and they were going to do the best thing possible whilst digging stuff out of the ground yeah. as opposed to a startup miner may cut costs because they don't have the scale and revenue and research. And yes. so I was sort of saying, well, I prefer to just, if I want to be in the market, I'm going to be in the index and I'm going to own those companies. Mm. And so I still have that belief. Um, and investing ethically is very hard because Woolworths well, everyone might, has a different version yeah of we have a so. different different mission Woolworths yeah. is really hard as a company to to talk through because it owns poker machines and so you can say well I hate that but also they're helping the farmers at the same time and so or they're ripping off the farmers depending which yeah. department you look at but the the it's Every time you hold the lens against a particular company you've got to have a set of rules which is why yeah it's difficult man. it's difficult but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's just like recycling. If you recycle 80% of the stuff you meant to do, that's mm. better than going, oh, recycling is too hard. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because, okay, like how far do you push the ethics? Because uh, if, if, if you're not comfortable investing in a mining company, are you comfortable using electricity well that's the whole that's the whole thing it's because you you've got you've got to just do something if you if sure. you believe it you've got to do something yes. because the fact that a client will come to you and say oh, i i don't want to invest in that company mm. and they pull out their iphone that has 700 grams of whatever lithium, lithium stuff yeah, yada, in there yada, yada. we don't even know what damage that does to the environment absolutely and then they throw it out two years later in the tip and yeah. that leaks into the waterways and then they get a new iphone yeah um Everyone does that without thinking, <laughs> but at least we've taken a step forward. Okay. No, look, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it is hard. And I, I'm, I'm in two minds about ethical investments. I mean, like everyone alive, yes, it'd be lovely to have nice things happen. And if we can invest nicely, <laughs> that's a good thing. Like, obviously, like it is a very blanket high level i'm a fan of it it's hard to not be right who wants who wants less nice things it's yeah it's it's like it's like anything it's like would you like the environment to be better yeah correct you have you <laughs> if you phrase the question that way the answer has to be it yes. has to be yes would you like to recycle yes i would like yes. to do you is a different question yes. but yeah we all want this to we all are, well i'm starting to see in the evidence of the benefit of it as well as the investment managers are starting to now provide the solutions mm. at the same level. Like there was the whole, uh, you know, and I, you know, I have a philosophy around index funds, and now at least I can put a guns and nuclear screen over the top of the index fund, for example. So I know that it's not the best, but at least I know there's no tobacco, no guns in that particular part of the portfolio. Nuclear as in nuclear power or nuclear as in nuclear war? I believe it's as power in the concept. Yeah, that right. That's like the US, the US 
the US ethical fund just the very simple Vanguard one just cuts out those three or four things. Nuclear um, power, right? Yeah. So just and it's um, there's a really there's there's the whole thing of guns and tobacco because they don't add any like economic positivity to the world. Like you can, in terms of BHP, they're digging stuff out of the ground, which is helping build a building. So sure. it's kind of, we need a bu- we need buildings. Yeah. And so, electricity, coal. Yeah. We yeah. don't need guns. So if you want yeah. to cut that out of the it's portfolio, it's, it's sort of like the production of more guns doesn't lead to life being better in the future. But we'll probably stop there, otherwise. No, we'll but end you're up in right. The US. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such such a such a tricky subject, yeah. isn't it? And yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, I've I've followed it pretty closely. Um, you know, it, it's doubled in inflows in the last couple of mm, years. Mm. But 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 doubling means it's gone from like you know one, oh, low, yeah, one yeah less than one percent to yeah one percent yeah. yeah correct. So it's like. It's it's it, we're in early days, but you know absolutely, I, I can I can definitely see that happening. Um, yeah, so uh, so out of the out of the out of the royal commission, I would like to see the decoupling from um, product and advice at a legislative level. Mm. I'd love to see that happen. I'd love Rowena to just say. Wait a second. Here it it says that product and advice is the exact same thing. Let's decouple it from whatever it was, the Corpse Act, or um, I don't even know what act it's in. That's that's written in, but it's a it's a very weird and peculiar um, premise for advice to live in. Mm. And because if I if I look at the parties of the Royal Commission that's going on, I see it as advisors regulatory bodies and products and so like three different aspects and um it's going to be interesting to see where the blame lies at the end of all this Mm. is it the products is it the advisors or is it the or is it were the rules always there but the regulatory bodies never enforce it it. so yeah i'm very interested to see where the blame lies i always have like the reason why we need lots of regulation is because we're talking about people's financial lives. So it's really Absolutely. important. Like I always have this off the cuff example, but it's not as important as finance. But it's like when you go in to buy a Mercedes Benz at the dealership, right? And you speak to the guy and he tells you all the features and benefits of the Mercedes Benz. He doesn't then say, please now you don't need to go do this, but I've already been down to BMW and I understand the features and benefits of the BMW. Yeah. And here's a chart that contrasts <laughs> the benefits and features and costs of you buying a BMW and a Mercedes Benz. Absolutely. It's a trivial example, but the consumer, I believe rationally, should know that when they walk into a Mercedes Benz dealership, they're buying a Mercedes Benz. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the Mercedes Benz dealer doesn't have to disclose that he's shipped twice the amount of Benzes this month, so he's going to get a huge bonus from from head office. Now, yeah. so there's always conflicts in every industry. Absolutely. Um, and they're not going to – they don't go away. Like, yes. You know, Uber charges a percentage of revenue as, as, a fee, as a fee model. Correct. Every subscription service that we pay is a percentage of – we're paying percentages of revenue yeah. on, on everything. So – the, the concept of, of, of the product manufacturer having to further say that they're the product manufacturer, like we can have the advisors over over here, but then they can't be employed by those manufacturers. Or if they are, it's the old school agency model, which probably, you know, not all of the listeners know, but the, the old AMP lifeies were employed by AMP yeah. and they were only selling AMP. Yeah. And it's sort of if you could make the client aware, there is no conflict. Yeah. Because you're saying, I work for AMP, I'm employed by AMP to recommend this AMP product. Yeah. If you don't want the AMP product, yeah. you have to go down the road to someone to someone else. Like there's still a need People will still buy from a from a product provider without an with or without an advisor. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I think that the pressure should be on the product providers to create good products, right? Yeah. And then and then the, there should not be this massive pressure for an advisor, in my opinion. Even even something like the best interest duty, right? Mm. So 
Um, okay, here's another trivial example, but I've just thought of this off the top of my head. Now, let's say uh, uh, I'm, I'm recently married. So my wife goes and gets a haircut, right? Let's say, let's say she walks in and she goes, gets a haircut. And because uh, women like to spend a lot of money on their hair. Well, they have more. You know, they have more <laughs> of it, yeah. And, uh, but let's say she walks in and then, and then, you know, about to hand over the money or about to book mm. in a session and, and the, the, <laughs> the hairdresser would say something like, is this haircut in your best interest? Uh, should you perhaps go and pay that money off your credit card? You know, <laughs> like it's such a, like no, no other industry has the, the burden of being the best and and like emphasis on the best the mm. best thing mm. that can happen i think under that regulatory environment where you are ensuring the best thing happens it's 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 an absurd it's an absurd requirement because a it's implicit right it, 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 like if you're if you're an advisor uh, and you want to have clients, you've got to do a really good job, right? Yeah. So, so that's implicit. But if you're if you're asked to provide the best, I, I'm just so caught up on this word best because it's yeah. so easy to prove that one of the things wasn't the best thing yeah. ever. And the the and, the reason the reason why we we have had legislation to make us do it is because we didn't do it ourselves. But if we got rid of commissions, which we have, that really but, gets rid of it, a lot of the yeah. reasons why the best interest yeah. duty was so, come in. So yeah. FOFA sort but, of can't... But like, it's not... But commissions are still there. Oh, it's on like insurance. Read, yeah. Go and... Well, not even that. Go and read Batesy's LinkedIn posts about... Um, the property developers that are still emailing him with the eight and a half. Yeah, no, I have commission. seen it. I have so seen it. you know that's all the rental guarantees. All the all get the rid of that. I've got no problems with getting We've, rid of that. But but yeah, how like that? You got to you got to get rid of that. Absolutely, in order to remove I've got no problem things. with that. But we need to we need to professionalize our industry and have our own body that's like the bar. I know if we were if we were as professional as an accounting accountant in the context that they have professional bodies who who properly hire and fire advisors yeah. and if we or the or the um, legal profession who has the bar which means you have to apply and it's, pre- it's prestigious to be part of the bar and if you let down your fellow lawyers at on the bar you're out mm. and so we don't police ourselves uh, to that high standard and if yeah. we so if we re- if ASIC removed the best interest and said okay guys now you're you've got to do it but you've got to do it better than the two other professionals that are talking to clients then all of this would go away but then we've actually got to stick to our guns and fire the advisors that are not oh, no doing that. the right thing anyone and, any I, I think Let's definitely get rid of commissions on properties. I like that concept. How come that hasn't been done yet? Rowena, if you're listening, get rid of commissions in investment properties. That's crazy. That that but still they'll, exists. See, so they'll even it, it's they'll pay commissions. It's like, but commissions exist in everything. Do you know if I, um, you know the Hey You app where you order coffee, mm. right? So if I refer you to the app, mm. I get a free coffee. That's a commission. Do you want to do it now? Well, I'll do it afterwards <laughs> if you haven't signed up. No, but, but, but it's not but, a financial product. It's not an investment. So I've got no problems with commissions, but commissions on investments should absolutely be gone. Mm. And they're already gone from financial products. They should absolutely be gone from yeah. property and as well. Good. Yeah, they should be gone from property. They're, they're absolutely. Pro- yeah. Hands down. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah, good. All right. Done. Delete, delete them. Because it, it's always about incentives. And so if and if you can, it's it's crazy that, even though there are commissions, then the like if Batesy was not a financial advisor and he was he was a mortgage broker, for example, which he is, but if he was just that, yeah. or if he was an accountant, they're not even he wouldn't there's no obligation even to disclose Yeah, man, it's crazy. It's those, crazy those commissions. It's absolutely just insane. like I don't have to disclose the free coffee that I get when I recommend that you get the coffee app, but I these what, things are much different. Now it's that a you $3 have dis- coffee. Now yeah. that you have disclosed it, can we go halves in it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll share the commission. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that it's 
always there's been this this concept of incentives, and so ec- economists have been looking at this for years about anything that has, especially financial incentive, that it changes the way in which people um, act. Yes, you know the. The classic, if and it roots from when we were kids, and they do these studies with kids now about they give a kid a donut or a sweet, and then they say, "If you can not eat it, and we'll be back in five minutes, and we'll give you two, so yeah. you can double your donuts if you're willing to oh, that's wait." That's a good deal. It's a good deal if you can wait, right? Yeah. As a kid, no one waits, <laughs> you know, and so it's just a it's a random example of the fact whenever there's incentives that that change the way in which you would think about the answer, that's then um, where problems occur. So uh, these, which these is why I think it's advisors great. that are out there that may be recommending clients set up self-managed super funds and then gear and buy a residential property off the plan, just hypothetically, I'm not sure if any of that, any advisors actually do that. Yeah. Um, but... If they do, like that's full of various in- incentives and cross referrals and all sorts of things. Um, Absolutely. So, th- I'm such a massive fan of getting rid of um, the commissions on investment products that we've done so far. I can't wait. Now I've got a new passion. I'd love to see it removed from the property industry as well. Mm. So it's completely eradicated mm. entirely from our from our industry. And once that happens. We don't need these crazy overburden, like best interest duty. You can get rid of best interest duty if there's no commissions, in my opinion. But I'm happy to be, I'm happy for someone to argue against that. But I am convinced that if someone isn't incentivized, mm. to use your point, then they're, they're going yeah, to work so in the best interest. It's, it's, it's very, there's no, re- there's no incentive not to. I get it. But there's also, like, if you want your client, can you, the, the terms of building a great advice practice means that also that you're able to advise and run your clients in an efficient manner, right? So there's, there's another argument to look at to go, well, if I've got, a hundred clients and they each have a hundred different superannuation funds because they're all out there and the hundred are all industry super funds, but they're all doing all similar. So in order for me to review and understand being able to talk to the client in depth about what their fund is doing, I now have to know a hundred Yeah, and or the best interest for the client and for me is that if we could all be on a couple of investment strategies that we both know and understand and both are you know, they're both index related, so they're both in the best interest. The My business efficiency means that I don't have to call 100 super funds oh, yeah. to find it out. So Absolutely. there'll always be that thing about going, well, super fund A and super fund B, they're all pretty similar, but I like to work with super fund A yeah. because I know the BDM, I know the owners, yeah. I've been using this company for a long time. Yeah. There's a lot of benefit in you coming across to this product. Absolutely. And the one you've got, is still the same. Yes. And and so there's a best interest that still has to come both ways in going, but you've got to just explain that to the client. And the vast majority of clients will say yes. Yeah. You know, if you do the calculations, you show the work, they'll make that decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, look, the whole, the Royal Commission has been a very interesting journey. I would, you know, it's like it's you watch it. Rowena yeah. is pretty pretty awesome in terms of her skill set in, in questioning and yeah, the, obviously the research team behind her yeah. has been reading a lot of documents to find, you know, the needle in the haystack of the of the particular cases that are brought forward, but there's probably it's lots so interesting. Of others. It's so interesting the stuff that gets brought out. Uh, mm. And it, like that example I used earlier about the trustees of the super funds getting mm. in trouble because they use the in-house bank account. Yeah. I was like, I've never thought of that one. Mm. But as soon as it's mentioned, I was like, oh, Everyone's yeah. Doing it. Yeah. And look, the whole, the the general and the insurance stuff that's coming out at the moment is atrocious in terms of the 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 sales tactic in relation oh, to, sell, yeah, to selling yeah, the insurance yeah, products. Yeah. And it's it's all of that thing about... Just like the insurance company that sells the flood, the the person at home insurance in a flood zone where the they know the policy has flood excluded, but yes, it's in the PDS, which is a hundred pages. Like that was never in the client's best interest, but they the corporate doesn't have the same yeah. obligations. Yeah, because so. that, that that was um, yeah. I, I won't mention what company 
just got busted for that in the press recently. But uh, with the Twitter account on XY, mm. we've been trying to like make it a bit funnier. Mm-hmm. And so I asked my mate, I sent him an article and he comes back and uh, he, he sends me a picture of um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross oh, yeah. with ABC on the board. It's got yeah, always, always be, be closing. No, always be cold calling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I put it up there. And, uh, well, the Glenn Roxy yeah, Roxy great. was the first guy to play Glenn Glary, um, Glenn Ross in the <laughs> in no the doubt. training. <laughs> that was like week one training video. Here's the leads, guys. The um, leads are weird. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I love that. So they were real estate agents, not uh, financial planners. But yes, it's all this, oh, it's everyone. You have to go watch that movie if you haven't watched it already. All right, mate. Well. Um, I believe we've got a, a weekend to kick off into. So um, yeah, yeah. I self plug for me. We'll absolutely. see how we go yeah. on Monday. But I'm running the marathon on Sunday. Impressive. So, so is it a full or half? No, a marathon. What? Yeah. So I do. The I've hell? run half marathons and marathons in the past. But whenever I do a half marathon, and then people say, "Oh, good luck in the marathon," I go, "No, no, no." It's only a half, <laughs> uh, but this time it is the full one. So uh, by the time this is released, I'll either be successful or unsuccessful, but right. I'm feeling pretty good about it. So Impressive as long as it's stuff. not too hot, uh, yeah. it'll be good. And, um, and if anyone wants to get in contact with you to find out more about what you do or, or you know, just to- No Twitter, no Facebook. Uh, I have a website, yeah. which is called wealthnetwork.net.au. Yes. Uh, and our financial planning business, absolutewealthadvisors.com.au. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, on LinkedIn as well. So you just type in Dean Holmes. Yep. Uh, there's only two of us, the Dean Holmes, the murderer from the UK. <laughs> Don't connect with him uh, or Dean Holmes, the financial advisor in Sydney. So that's another story. I won't tell you that one, but Dean Holmes, the murderer from the UK, <laughs> if you Google it, it's quite a disturbing slash funny story. I like how you use the word slash as the, and total pun intended. Well, All right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much yeah. for coming on. And uh, let's let's maybe go uh, grab a beer. Good man. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.